Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Peter Robinson and this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. Today I've got Dr. Frank Casse, who is going to talk about his perspectives on the open problems with roll-up design. So Frank, before you dive into the talk, um, can you please um, introduce yourself? Yes, so thank you, Peter. Uh, so I'm Frank, I'm a computer scientist with uh, an interest in uh, concurrent systems and formal verification. Uh, I've worked as an academic for a number of years in France and in uh, Australia. And uh, four years ago, I joined Consensus and started to work on uh, blockchain systems. Uh, things I've worked on uh, mainly were uh, uh, formal verification problems like verification of the beacon chain, uh, the deposit contract, um, smart contracts in general, and uh, more recently, uh, semantics of the uh, Ethereum virtual machine with uh, David and Joanne and Horacio that I see on this talk. And uh, a couple of months ago, I joined uh, Mantle, which is actually uh, formerly BitDAO, uh, which is a, 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 an institution developing a layer two, a rollup. Uh, and as the head of research, of course, I'm interested in identifying research issues and problems that we can try to solve to make our technology better. Uh, hence, this talk on uh, trying to uh, see our rollups work and uh, what can we do to make them better. All right. Well, that sounds like um, sounds like you've got the right background uh, to give us an awesome talk. So let's hear it. Do you want us to ask? questions at any time or what do you yeah, want to yeah, yeah so feel free to interrupt me anytime and uh, if I'm I'm not a, as I said before a role of a guru so if I make a mistake and you think it's inaccurate or uh, completely wrong feel free to stop me and uh, I'll fix that for next time okay cool all right please far away right so let me check oh, so I won't see you I'm going to minimize the Windows, so Peter, I, I rely on you to, uh, to interrupt me with something in the chat. Right. So, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what I think are some open problems in rollups. I'm not claiming that these are all the open problems that you have in, in rollups. Um, and um, so the first thing, uh, what I'm going to cover is probably to go back to the, of, uh, the origin. Uh, what's the issue that rollups uh, uh, are trying to solve? And this means uh, the scalability problem in Ethereum. Where does it stem from? And uh, what are our rollups doing to try and, and improve on it? And I'll talk about the design of rollups and uh, again, open problems. And at the end, I've got a short list of resources, not exhaustive again. So if you're like me, and, and a couple of uh, years ago, I started to try and understand what rollups were. If you uh, Google it, you'll find lots of different things, and uh, it seems to be magical because um, I, I, it solves the scalability issue. And uh, again, if you look it up, you'll see all of these, uh, these words. If you understand all of them and you can explain all of them, uh, this talk probably won't um, give you anything new. But on my side, for instance, um, uh, I was trying to understand how Rollup can provide scalability. What's the magic in there? What are the... Uh, Differences between fraud and validity proofs, so that's not too hard to understand. Uh, some uh, notions of uh, finality, things that you see in uh, in, in standard uh, blockchain, uh, let's say, uh, technologies. So I'm going to try and talk about some of these things, not all of them. Uh, uh, if you if you want me to talk a bit about other well, some of the topics in on this slide that I'm not going to cover later on, feel free to ask questions. I may have some answers. Right, so what's the problem with Ethereum? So just a reminder that um, the Ethereum network is basically implemented a replicated state machine. So in this state machine, you've got users submitting transactions to local nodes, and then these nodes are going to communicate the transactions, uh, run a consensus algorithm to order them, and then execute, let's say, a state transition and replicate the state. Uh, in an asynchronous manner. So the idea is that everybody's going to compute uh, the same uh, sequence of states, of course, at, at different uh, speed. And that's how the Ethereum networks, uh, network works. You, you archive everything, uh, all the, well, the, the, 
the full nodes are archiving everything, uh, the transactions, the states, and so on, and it's public, so you can replay the transactions and check that uh, the, the computation of the next state, so whether your transaction has been uh, processed correctly, whether it has been processed correctly or not, and so on. And at the core of the Ethereum network, there's what's called the Ethereum virtual machine that's in charge of computing the next state. So you take a given state with the, let's say, the current balances of the accounts. There's a transaction transferring some assets from Alice to Bob. And this Ethereum virtual machine is going to execute and produce a new state. So in this design, um, there's lots of communication. Uh, there's uh, some security provided by uh, some uh, mechanisms, uh, st uh, staking and uh, slashing uh, nodes that are uh, trying to cheat. So uh, there's a lot of things uh, that are uh, going on. So more details, so sorry. Um, what does it mean in terms of, um, of timing and scalability? So I'll try to um, show you this slide. Uh, it, it looks complicated, but it's not too complicated. So you start uh, in, in the Ethereum network by submitting a transition. So your transition, you want to transfer some assets and it goes into the memory pool of some local node. And from there on, this node is going to send with his, to his peers the transition, the transaction thread that you want to execute. And at some point, uh, one of the nodes is going to get this transition, uh, this transaction, sorry, uh, from the mempool and propose it as the next transaction to execute. So for simplicity, I would say in this talk, I'm going to assume that in a block, we put only one transaction. With it. This is without loss of generality, but it, it, it simplifies the problem. So this transaction is going to be picked by a given node, and this node is going to propose it as a transaction, uh, uh, producing a state transition from S to S prime. And it's going to broadcast this proposal to other node. So at some point, uh, this transaction will be in a proposed block. And then these other nodes in the network are going to re-execute the proposed transaction uh, to check that the computation of the next state has been done correctly and uh, produce a next state. And there's also a next stage in this, uh, let's say, process. Um, they may be, uh, let's say, different options for successive states because everything happens in, in parallel. So every node uh, doesn't have actually a, a sequence of states, but a, a, a tree of states, and they have to decide which tree they want to keep. And this is happening in a consensus mechanism where nodes are voting for the head of the chain. And after a certain amount of time, when some blocks have been, uh, or transaction in blocks have been somehow voted for by a super majority, a transaction in the block will be confirmed. So the origin, uh, the node uh, th that you submitted your transaction to will get a sort of a notification that the transaction has been included in the block. And this block has achieved the special status, which is called finalized, which means that it's uh, very, very unlikely to be reverted, to, to, to revert it and cancel this block. Uh, you would need a, a very high stake in, in terms of ether and in terms of money to, to, to revert it. So it's very likely, very, very likely that this block is, is uh, immutable and won't be changed. And that's called the finalization of the transaction. So overall, the trip of your transaction uh, takes around 16 minutes. And you can see here that actually, uh, if you want to, to have uh, uh, blockchain systems adopted as mainstream payment systems, for instance, it's far from optimal and we can't really wait when you're in the shop uh, 16 minutes for your transaction to be validated. So what can we do? Uh, I'll give you first uh, uh, maybe uh, more insight into what's happening. So there's a real scalability problem in Ethereum. And uh, on the left-hand side, I've got this table that sum summarizes actually um, uh, the sort of the timings, how things are happening. So in the Ethereum blockchain, time is divided into slots uh, and slots are approximately 12 seconds. And uh, 32 slots uh, make an epoch, which is approximately 30, well, 6.4 minutes. So in the Ethereum uh, network, a block is produced on average most of the time, right, every, at every slot, so every 12 seconds. Sometimes there's a slot without a block, but it's uh, supposed to be a, a rare event. And at boundaries of epochs, there are things happening, and these things are uh, finalizing blocks and so on. So the blocks are not actually... Um, 
finalized uh, at every slot, but they are finalized uh, every 6.4 meters, well, uh, at every boundary of, of an epoch. And to finalize the blocks of question, you need to exchange messages and so on. It takes some time. So the average time here in this table is that a new block is produced every 12 seconds, a sort of uh, an intermediate status between a, a, a new block and a finalized block is a justified block. So this is unlikely to be reverted, but um, still more likely than a finalized block. So there's a sort of a, you know, a, a grade of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, final, finality for blocks. So a justified block uh, is supposed to be happening every 6.4 minutes, a finalized block every 13 minutes. And for your transaction, because your transaction can be submitted just in the middle of an epoch, on average, it takes 2.4 epoch, 2.5 epochs. So this is around 16 minutes. So if you want to know uh, how it translates into, um, let's say, transactions uh, uh, in terms of the throughput, so we can take something which is uh, the maximum block capacity in Ethereum, which is given by the maximum, uh, let's say, gas or resource that can be consumed. Uh, in a block, and this uh, maximum amount of gas is uh, 30 million gas. So this is when the block is full. So this is not the target, I would say, uh, in Ethereum. The target is to achieve an average of 15 million, half of it. Uh, you take the, the best case for your transaction, so the transaction that costs the minimum, which is just a transfer of assets of Ether, which is 21,000 um, gas. And we divide by 12 seconds. So that means that what you can expect for very simple transactions is a throughput of 120 transactions per second, per second, which is TPS. And what's observed uh, on, on uh, Etherscan and so on, uh, statistics is actually 15 transactions per second, because of course you may, uh, 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 let's say, send transactions that are not the simple transactions, but more uh, complicated one uh, running some smart contracts and so on, they would consume more gas. So that's uh, what's happening. And the blocks, of course, are not uh, at full capacity every, every time. Um, so what, what is observed is 15 transactions per second. So clearly, the, this is uh, far uh, from uh, uh, being enough to be adopted as a mainstream payment system. Any questions so far? So if none, I'll, I'll continue. So, is there any magic so that we can improve things? So in, in the blockchain ecosystem, there's what's called the blockchain trilemma. So this is not, um, for me, this is not a theorem or whatever. This is something that uh, people believe is true, which is um, the following. Uh, what you would like to get is decentralization, security, and scalability. So decentralization means that you need uh, only low trust in the components, low costs. So, uh, uh, they can be some uh, malicious actors in the system, but um, uh, if a fraction of them is malicious, you're still going to achieve uh, uh, correctness. Low cost, uh, everyone can participate with some uh, custom well standard hardware. You don't need to buy very expensive computers. And decentralization is usually achieved with a consensus mechanism. For instance, in Ethereum, there's a fork choice and LMD goes through. Security, what you want to do is to uh, have your system to be resilient to attacks, uh, to have the data publicly available so that people can verify that transactions have been correctly executed. And scalability, that's what I was mentioning before. You'd like, of course, your system to be efficient uh, with a high throughput and so on. So there are uh, solutions that can be implemented uh, on, on the Ethereum network, which is called layer one. Um, and uh, these solutions will be implemented in the next couple of years. Uh, the main one is uh, called sharding, which is um, uh, dank sharding or proto dank sharding, which is supposed to get uh, 100,000 transactions per second. So we'll see if they can achieve it. But in the meantime, there's no really good solution to, uh, to, to get more transactions per, per second. So what Wallops uh, aim to achieve is to provide more scalability, so a higher throughput. And of course, if you believe in the uh, blockchain trilemma, this means that you're going, you're going to compromise on either decentralization or security. So I'll try to cover these topics in the next couple of, of slides. Right, so how do you scale with rollups? So the main idea is that you're going to introduce some sort of parallelism. So you're going to remove the execution from what's called 
the, the Ethereum chain, which is usually uh, called on-chain. On-chain means on Ethereum, on the Ethereum network. You're going to execute uh, the state transitions off-chain. So of course, this is nice because you provide, you get more CPU, you can uh, have activities running in parallel, but at the same time, it means that you have um, an execution engine. So basically the Ethereum virtual machine that's running uh, on another chain. Uh, so um, uh, how does it work? What are the, the problems that can arise with that? The other thing is that you really need to, uh, be, to be able to bridge or transfer your assets from on-chain to off-chain to the, the off-chain, the roll-up, because otherwise, right, there would be some race conditions if you if you were uh, uh, in two parallel thread uh, modifying, let's say, the balance of two different accounts, uh, they won't be uh, synchronized and you could be double spending or have some, uh, again, race conditions on, on some uh, state of the system. So you will need to transfer your assets from the main chain or part of your assets from the main chain, Ethereum on-chain to the off-chain to be able to work with them. The other idea in rollups is to use what's called sequencing. And the idea is to batch states and transitions. So I'll describe it later on, but what it, what it, it results in is that there's no, no consensus usually in, in, in rollups. So you don't run a consensus. Uh, this saves time, but of course, at the uh, detriment of uh, decentralization. So that's uh, basically where uh, the blockchain trilemma uh, is showing up. You in increased the throughput, but you decreased the decentralization. And finally, how do you preserve security? You're going to commit uh, the transactions that you're processing and the results of the computation. You're going to commit them on, on the layer one, on the mainnet. So you're going to make some data available uh, so that uh, the computations, the state transitions, and so on can be audited or verified um, um, uh, by a uh, third party, uh, which means again, so uh, that you need uh, somehow some cross-chain communication. There will be some, uh, still some throughput limitations because you have to um, um, send some transactions to this layer one. So if layer one is limited in terms of the number of transactions per second, um, this uh, commitment of uh, data to or, or states to uh, L1 will at some point limit your ability to increase your throughput. Right, so how does it work in, in a rollup? So I, I don't make a difference uh, right now uh, between uh, rollups, uh, let's say optimistic rollups and uh, uh, ZK rollups, uh, if, if you know what that is, but this is the main mechanism that's adopted for them. Um, you've got a user and users, they submit transaction to a single main pool and the transactions are ordered. So there's usually a single actor on the rollup, which is in charge of ordering the transition, deciding the order of the transition. And then the order, the transitions, the order transitions are published via a smart contract to layer one. So you publish the data. And what you're doing here is that you only publish the transaction data. You don't require the layer one to execute them. So what you can do is to use a mechanism called uh, uh, using the call data when you, you call a smart contract on, a, on layer one. And it's fairly cheap to uh, publish data corresponding to transactions compared to executing uh, some code. So you're publishing, you're ordering on layer one. And at some point, of course, uh, when, when this transaction of publishing will be uh, finalized, uh, you will have committed to this sequence of transactions. And in all of the rollups, this is uh, immutable. When it's decided, you're not going to change it. And at the same time on the rollup, you're going to compute uh, the state transitions for this sequence of transactions and create a new block. So that's your sort of uh, state transition on the layer two. So you create a, a new block with the sequence of transactions. And where you're going to, uh, to speed up and gain in terms of uh, time and space is that instead of committing all the single states on layer one, you're going to commit uh, an encryption or, or let's say uh, an encryption of the, the sequence of states that you've been computing. So pra in practice, this is done via smart contracts also, and you commit a, a hash of this sequence of transactions. And if you want to know how to do it, you can actually use a, a Merkle tree and you commit the hash root of the Merkle tree of this sequence of states that you've been uh, computing at layer two. So the layer two is going to store, of course, the different states 
but you're going to commit in one, um, uh, let's say, in, in, in a sort of a one hash, you're going to use one hash to commit um, the sequence of states that you've computed. And that's where you, uh, you gain in terms of uh, cost as well. You're reducing the number of data you're posting to layer one. So that's the main idea of uh, our ops. So I haven't detailed in this, uh, in this slide the other mechanism, right? Because you've got uh, no decentralization in this system. There's a, a unique actor determining which uh, sequence of transactions uh, is going to be executed. Um, you don't really know whether this uh, actor is malicious or not, so they could be computing, uh, of course, uh, bad states, right? Uh, 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 they could be tampering with the states that are obtained after each computation and so on. So we need mechanisms uh, also to add to this, uh, to, to this first phase. We need mechanism to be able to verify that things have been going well. The way uh, it's usually done in rollups, so there's two things that you can do. Uh, you publishing the sequence of transactions, uh, so the order is published and is immutable. And uh, what you can, so what you can do is that external parties can actually read this sequence of transactions, and if they know the initial state, uh, the genesis state of the of the rollup, they can, uh, in theory, right, recompute everything, the state that would be obtained after executing this sequence of transactions, and they can detect uh, whether this state is different to the committed states that have been published by the main actor running the rollup. So in, in uh, optimistic rollups, you will have a sort of a time window to contest uh, the states that have been computed in the layer two. So you have, uh, let's say, seven days to check the sequence of transactions, the corresponding states that have been committed, and to contest it. In uh, ZK rollups, when you push the states, you have to push as well a proof that you've computed properly the sequence of states. And this proof is going to be checked before you can actually commit this state. So there's different, uh, let's say, strategies that can uh, that can uh, arise from this uh, design. So what are the the main things that you have to Frank, take care of? Any question? Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the chat, you might want to have a look at the chat. It's been quite yeah. active, and okay. um, but so we, we might want to yeah. um, have a have a run through. Do you want? To, can you open the chat, or do you want me to read? Them yeah, out? yeah, I'm doing that now. Yeah. All right, so are these changes specific to all rollups or primarily ZK or optimistic rollups? So I, I think they are not specific to any ZK or optimistic rollups. They apply to uh, all of them. Yeah. And then the so consensus uh, will need to exist for decentralized sequencing. Yes, I'll talk about that later. Yeah, this is one of the challenges. Um, does a mempool structure exist in rollup nodes? So yeah, they have to buffer the transaction. So it's usually called um, an inbox or a mailbox. So you push your transactions in and the sequencer is going to pull uh, transactions from the, uh, the inbox. So roll-up nodes are the mempool different than Yes. Uh, are there decentralized layer two networks right now? Um, I don't think so. So I'll talk about decentralization later on and I can come back to this question uh, specifically. I think it's in the next uh, few slides. So I I'll try to, if I don't talk about it, remind me about it. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. Um, it looks the sequencer operator. So uh, yeah, I'll talk about it. This is uh, the, the, the issue about the sequencer operator and front running and so on is actually related to decentralization. So I'll talk about it later. Sounds good. So that, and that sorry sounds to good, throw you yeah. off your slides. Sorry? I said, thank you. And sorry to throw you off your slide slightly. No, no, that's okay. So yeah, so these are the things that I'm going to discuss in, in the next uh, couple of slides. So. Um, uh, I'm usually used to provide uh, technical talks and solving, uh, let's say, uh, well-formalized problems. So this one, this talk is not about that. It's identifying issues, and I'll give you some, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, description of the problems that can arise so that if you're a researcher or an engineer, whatever, you can probably say, oh, yeah, I can solve it, or, or uh, maybe I should try to solve it. So what, what do we have to do? Again, we have to bridge assets from uh, one layer to another one and bridge them back. 
So the way rollups work is you're going to um, to take your uh, ether, for instance, and say, yeah, I would like to um, uh, use the rollup to to use my ether, but you you need to have a sort of a, a bridge to enable you to work with a copy of your ether and so on. And then at some point you'd like to uh, let's say. Uh, off ramp and, and get some money or transfer them ether to another uh, currency, you need to transfer them back to Ethereum. So you need a bridge in both directions. You also need, if you want your rollup to be successful, is uh, to be able to run the code that you would be running on layer one, to run it on the layer two on the rollup, and it should uh, probably give the same result, right? So that's uh, that could be an issue. Um, you want to make sure that the data you are uh, you are providing. So when I was talking about posting the sequence of transactions that you have committed to, you want to make it available for third party to be able to verify that you have computed the state correctly. So how do you do that on, on layer one? You've got the blockchain, you've got the Genesis block, all the blocks are uh, available so you can verify how it works. How do you do it um, on layer two? There's some uh, finalization issue as well. So when you submit a transaction, when is it um, irreversible? When is it uh, uh, finalized and, and, and immutable? So on, on layer one, again, there are protocols, the LM, LMD ghost, uh, super majority, justification, uh, finalization, and so on. And as I was mentioning before, it takes an average uh, to 16 minutes. Uh, there's another issue as well. You're going to post, uh, let's say, trans sequences of transactions and the, the computation of the sequence of stakes that should arise from executing these sequence of transactions. Uh, so you would like to verify that these uh, the states computed are, are correct or not. So on the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, your computation is uh, transferred, uh, posted, sent to uh, lots of other nodes, and they can recompute the next state. And if they disagree, of course, they wouldn't vote for your, uh, your your next state computation. They would vote for another one, and your 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 wrong computation would not be accepted. And there's a mechanism uh, with some stakes and so on, and you can show that if you want to force, let's say. A wrong computation, you would need more than one third of all the stakes uh, of the validators in the system. So, um, with client diversity and the fact that the computation is uh, performed by lots of different uh, nodes, you can ensure that the, uh, the computation of the next state is somehow uh, correct, according to what I'll, I'll discuss it later as well. The decentralization is also an issue, as, as uh, I saw as well in the chat, right? Because you've got a single sequencer deciding uh, which transitions are going to be in the next uh, batch. So the thing is, of course, you can censor some transitions. You can decide to order transition uh, 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 as you will, and maybe front run or whatever. Uh, yeah, this can exist as well. So. In Ethereum, uh, this is supposed to be uh, handled by uh, uh, choosing the validators in a random order, having the proposal bit the separation scheme and stuff like that. So, but we need something as well on layer two. And now um, on the Ethereum virtual machine, when you execute your transaction, of course you pay for the execution of your transaction uh, as a user and uh, uh, as an actor, let's say validator and so on, you can get rewards or be slashed when, uh, uh, you, you, you verify some transactions or where you do something wrong. So the same mechanism uh, may be needed on the layer two. So how does it work exactly? And what are the problems that you can, that you can have? So I'll try to cover some of these issues in the next uh, few slides. Right, so the first one is bridging. And uh, so in this context, what you have to do is to um, make sure that you can take some of your assets, let's say ether, um, have a sort of a copy of your ether on the rollup on the layer two and use your ether on layer two. So this is usually um, the simplest way to do it is to have some smart contracts uh, to, to sort of uh, twin contracts that would uh, bridge from layer one to layer two and layer two to layer one. And the standard solution is to, when you want to send your, your assets, let's say ether to a layer two, you would lock some of your ether in a bridging contract then there will be some mechanism uh, to trigger the minting of the equivalent number of tokens, but copy of them, they are usually called the wrapped, uh, whatever tokens, so wrapped ether, so a copy of your token that you've locked in the bridging contract on layer one will be 
um, made available to you and minted on layer two, you use them on layer two. And at some point, when you want to transfer the remaining tokens that you have on your, on your account, you will try to transfer them back to layer one. And the mechanism that's usually used is that you're going to burn them uh, so they will disappear on layer two. And this contract is going to synchronize with the, the bridging contract on layer one that will deliver, somehow unlock uh, some of the ether and, and send the equivalent of the tokens you have on layer two back to your account on layer one. So you can see here that there's a communication L1 to L2 messaging. Uh, so you need to have some um, a good communication uh, and if you want to, uh, to transfer the assets from one layer to another. Another thing that you have to do is to be able to execute bytecode, so EVM bytecode that you would have executed on layer one, you'd like to execute the same on layer two. So why? It's because if you have uh, your smart contracts, for instance, compiled to, uh, to EVM bytecode, then you need to change them or have a specific compiler to run them on layer two. Um, you may not be very happy with it, uh, and you can't really ensure that it does the same thing as it would be doing on layer one. So these are the two problems that you have to, to solve. And uh, what are, let's say, the, uh, the main challenges in there is that there's a cross-chain interoperability. So how do you communicate, let's say, generically from layer one or a, a layer uh, to, to another one? So the way it works, if I understand well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong at the moment, is uh, uh, bridging from L1 to L2, you've got the bridging contract on L1 and it will uh, send, well, produce some uh, log or event messages. So the, there should be some mechanism on layer two that's monitoring the log messages on L1 and retrieve them and trigger some, uh, some minting when they see some messages coming from their own bridging contract and so on. So that's a complicated mechanism. Uh, there were lots of attacks uh, in the last few years on, on bridges. And uh, if you want to uh, get a reminder of this, there were uh, recent talks at this meeting actually by uh, Ernest a couple of months ago and David uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I encourage you to watch them again. So basically the problems here are to design some uh, cross-chain interoperability mechanism that can be used out of the box. So this is not fully solved as I understand it. and uh, uh, let's say mechanisms or templates that you could try to get to show that your bridges or the smart contracts that you implement to, to perform the operation of the bridges are secure so you won't lose assets, they won't be attacked and so on. On the, uh, let's say, code uh, side, so you want to execute the same bytecode, so do you have to modify it or not? So the issue here is that some of the, uh, the opcodes in the EVM uh, they have some meanings that are actually uh, strongly tied to uh, what's in the EVM on layer one. So some of them, for instance, like the base fee, uh, EIP-1559, gives you the current base fee, um, how much it costs uh, uh, to, 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 to how much the gas is uh, in the current block. Uh, block number is also an opcode in the Ethereum virtual machine that's, uh, of course, related to the blocks that you have built. So when you port your code and you execute it on layer two, uh, you have to deal with these opcodes and, and, and decide what's going to happen. What's the base fee? What, what meaning has the base fee on layer one, uh, on, on layer two? Uh, it's not probably, sometimes you can even pay in another currency the gas on, on your uh, layer two. You don't need to pay it in ETH. You could pay it in Arbitrum or Optimism token and so on. So uh, what does it mean, the base fee? So, uh, the, the current solution is uh, that some of the opcodes are somehow disabled, so you can't really use them. Um, so that's also, that's an issue. And uh, this issue is usually bundled under the term EVM equivalence. So what exactly can you execute on layer two? Can you execute unmodified code and does it have exactly the same meaning? So there are uh, currently solutions uh, that are trying to implement uh, the, all the opcodes. So there's a different, there are also different levels of uh, what's called EVM equivalence. So again, equivalence here, I, I'm a bit sorry about it, but it's not formally defined usually, it's a wish. Um, so there's a, an article by Vitalik describing different types of EVM equivalence in, in uh, increasing order uh, of strength. So now uh, another uh, issue that can of course arise is what's called the data availability issue. So in this, uh, in, in, in this slide I've shown that actually you publish the transaction data. So you publish them on layer one, at some point they become uh, finalized. 
Um, the thing is that if you, if you publish them on layer one, uh, you still have some interaction with layer one. And again, it's going to limit your throughput. You can't publish more than 15 uh, per second. Uh, so you are dependent on the somehow performance of, of layer one uh, to determine your, your overall performance. Of you may have to wait to push uh, more sequence of transactions to be, uh, to be uh, uh, archived on layer one. And when you push them on, so the solution that I'm going to show is maybe to change layer one to have a dedicated layer to handle data availability, but then you'll have the issue of deciding um, and showing that you actually can retrieve the data and the data are, are available. So how does it work? So you could, for instance, a couple of uh, weeks ago as well, there was a talk by um, Sri Ram Kanan on the uh, Eigen layer and Eigen DA, which is sort of a layer that can, for you, handle uh, data availability. So if you do so, uh, then you may increase if, if uh, Eigen, the data availability, uh, the availability layer has better performance than layer one. Of course, you increase uh, the throughput potentially, but at the same time, uh, you'd like to know whether uh, you can retrieve the data. So when you push the data to this uh, data availability layer, what kind of proof do you have that the data has been stored and not corrupted? Um, how long is it going to be stored for and so on? How much is it going to cost to retrieve it? Um, so just a, a minor point on that, on that note is that if you use a different layer one, a data availability layer, uh, the rollup that you're building is usually called, I think, a, a validium rather than a, a, a rollup because the security is not inherited directly from uh, layer one on uh, Ethereum. So you have to solve these issues. So another uh, problem that arises, as I mentioned before, is uh, what's called the finality problem. So on, on your layer two, at the top right, you're taking transactions, execute them, pushing the sequence of transactions to the layer one. And on layer two, what's happening is, well, once you've determined the sequence of transactions that you're going to execute, on layer two, this is final. This is final because you're not going to change this order. And this transaction pushing the, the, the order of transaction on layer one, at some point, uh, it, it should be, uh, you're not going to change your mind, right? You've decided which uh, order it was and you're not going to change it. So that's uh, the, the order of transaction is final. And you can recompute the state by processing the sequence of transactions uh, to retrieve the current state. So this is not going to change. But now, assuming you would like to transfer some asset from layer two to layer one, and you've performed some computation, you still need to wait for uh, the confirmation that your uh, sequence of transactions, and of course the sequence of states that you've computed has been accepted and has been uh, uh, validated somehow so that the computation is not corrupted. So you'll have a finality at some point on layer two. So um, here I wrote L1 finality, that's a bit misleading. It depends on L1 finality, but it's L2 finality. So at some point you will have finality of the transaction in L2. Um, it depends on the finality of the transaction on L1 or the data availability layer. If you're in a, an optimistic rollup, um, because the mechanism to, to verify that the computation has been done properly is a sort of a time window that you have to wait for. You may have to wait for uh, up to seven days uh, before your transaction in final on layer two. And then that means that you can't actually withdraw your funds from layer two to layer one, bridging them before this period of seven days. Uh, if you're in a ZK rollup, so you have finality uh, when you publish your sequence of states, but still you may be dependent on uh, uh, the 2.5 epochs uh, finality for uh, uh, for layer one, because your verification uh, in a ZK rollup is a call to a, trans a transaction and a call to a smart contract. So you need to wait until this uh, process has been fully done. So the question here is, um, how do we determine finalization? How can we shorten finalization? There are lots of, um, I think uh, solutions that have been proposed, uh, if I understand well, Arbitrum, they rely, which is an optimistic call-up, uh, they wait until uh, transactions have been finalized, well, the publication has been finalized on layer one, plus of course the seven days. Um, uh, optimism, they have some mechanisms to try and, and fast uh, 
somehow um, speed up uh, the finality, but uh, you need a mechanism uh, to sort of uh, handle potential reorganization on layer one that would impact uh, the result on layer two. So that's not very easy to understand. I don't really know how it works. If you know, please uh, let me know. Uh, but this is an issue to try and shorten the time uh, between finality uh, on layer one and the other layer and be able to transfer funds uh, rather quickly between the two layers. So it's not a matter of transferring the funds, but when can you do it? Uh, and can you do it fast enough? If you have to wait for seven days to withdraw your funds from layer two to layer one, that's, that's a big issue. So yeah, I've talked about that uh, already, so I'm going to see that. So now the verification uh, issue. So in, in a rollup, uh, the, what's called the sequencer is going to pick up some transactions from the mempool, order them, and compute the sequence of states. Um, and to do so, of course, this uh, sequencer is going to use an implementation of the, uh, of the EVM, so an EVM interpreter. It's going to compute the transition function. And um, it doesn't matter whether it's an optimistic rollup or a validity proof rollup. Um, you've got some mechanism to be able to verify that this uh, actor, the sequencer, is not malicious. So in optimistic rollups, you've got seven days to, to check whether this computation has been properly performed or not. And in the ZK rollups, you're going to get a, a proof posted with the uh, resulting state, and you can check the proof. The commonality between these two things is that you've got the sequencer computing the sequence of states or the new state with a, an, an, an EVM interpreter and the verifier, be it a ZK uh, verifier or um, a verifier, let's say an optimistic rollup that's going to recompute uh, the state has got their own implementation of the EVM virtual machine. So what's going to happen is, let's say in, a, in an optimistic uh, rollup, you may uh, have a verifier that picks up a sequence of transactions within the seven day window, replace it and say, oh, no, there was a mistake. Uh, well, I, 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 there was a difference into the, uh, in the state. And I found um, a state after one transaction that's not the one that has been computed. So there's a dispute in that case and you're going to have to resolve the dispute. The same thing could happen with the ZK rollup. You're posting a proof. And the verifier of the proof could say, no, uh, I don't accept the proof. Uh, the proof is wrong. I reject it. So at the end of the day, what's happening is that you've got a mechanism with the resolver. Again, an external third party node uh, in optimistic rollup that's going to redo the computation and, and maybe narrow it down to one instruction in the EVM and so on, or a verifier uh, on the ZK rollup. But they have their own version of the semantics of the EVM. And you're going to have to trust the semantics of this uh, verifier. So the question is, um, how do you know what the reference semantics is that, that's going to be used? Is it equivalent to, uh, in, a, in an optimistic rollup, the fraud proof resolver semantics or the ZK EVM semantics? So there are several issues in, in, in there. So for instance, in Arbitrum, uh, which is, uh, to my knowledge, the, the, the only uh, optimistic rollup with uh, a, a fraud proof mechanism enabled at the moment. The fraud proof is actually um, uh, a third party that can run GEF, and GEF has been computed with a target which is WASM. So you compute, you compute um, let's say you've got an execution uh, of GEF uh, with a target uh, code which is uh, to GEF compiled to WASM, and you execute GEF written in WASM, whereas the sequencer in Arbitrum is uh, executing GEF compiled to Go, but they are the same or, uh, source version of GEF. Um, you need, if you, if you want to trust uh, this mechanism, you need to trust the compiler from uh, uh, Go to uh, the native bytecode of your sequencer where you execute the code, uh, uh, I don't know, ARM64 or uh, M1 or whatever. And you also need to trust that the compiler to WASM and the semantic of WASM and the runtime of WASM, all of this is equivalent. So that's a huge uh, trusted computer base. For ZK rollups, you've got this um, uh, sort of, um, uh, semantics of the EVM, which is given not actually by a function, but usually by a relation. So you need to trust that the relation and the semantics of the EVM that's been written in uh, circuits and constraints is uh, somehow a, a trusted one and equivalent to uh, some, some uh, reference semantics that, that, that you would have. 
let's say the yellow paper, which is not a good reference semantics because it's, uh, it's ambiguous. So yeah, who do you trust? Uh, if you have a dispute, why would you trust a component that's have, that, that's replaced the computation better uh, than another one? So issues like that can arise actually, right? Um, if you uh, if you have different versions of the EVM, you update one, but you don't update another one and so on. So uh, when you resolve some disputes, how, how do you make sure that you, you can trust the resolver? Uh, another one, yeah, that I'm going to summarize here. I'm checking the time. Yeah, I'm going to conclude in a few uh, few slides. Uh, it's the fees and rewards. So um, I I'm going to give you a perspective in, in this uh, slide of uh, uh, an operator of a rollup. So when you operate a rollup, what you have to do is you've got batches of transactions arriving on your layer two. You're going to execute them very fast, and then you're going to post uh, the, the data of the transactions to layer one. But you don't really know at that time how much it go it's going to cost. So you know how much gas it's going to consume. You can compute it from the, uh, the, the size of the transaction data. But you don't know the gas price at the time where the transaction, uh, the, 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 the data availability transaction is going to be executed on layer one. So when you're going to charge your users, um, you're going to charge them with the predicted version of what it's going to cost uh, when you're going to post them later on. So ideally, uh, you would like to get the right price or you can overestimate it or whatever. If you overestimate it, you're going to charge your users, even if you spread the, the, the data availability fees, you're going to, to check your users more than uh, uh, they should have been charged. If you undercharge them, you're going to be out of your own pocket. You're going to pay fees for posting the transactions, but you haven't charged them properly. Um, so what mechanisms can you, can you try to implement to, uh, to, to, to get a better, let's say, uh, strategy? So in terms of uh, problems, this is uh, how do you ensure that you've got lower tax fees? And also, uh, can you make some profit or at least not lose money when you operate your layer two? Uh, again, if you post transaction data and every time you post them, you lose some money, it's not good. So what are the strategies? How can you adapt dynamically to the current price of Ether uh, on layer one um, so that you, you, you're getting uh, your money back and you're not charging your users too much? So at the moment, most of the uh, uh, layer twos, they work using gas oracles or simple... Uh, uh, prediction mechanisms uh, to to predict the price uh, that's going to be uh, the price of publishing uh, the, the data, the transaction data, and they try to adjust it dynamically. And finally, uh, decentralization. So as it was mentioned in the chat earlier, uh, you've got a, a unique sequencer in all of the rollups deciding the order of transactions. So that creates, uh, of course, uh, uh, potential censorship or delays in processing your transactions or font running. So ideally, you'd like to um, decentralize the sequencer, so have uh, uh, no central authority to decide the order of transactions. You can try to do so. Um, but then you probably need a consensus mechanism, which is going to introduce, uh, uh, to impact the performance of your layer two. They're going to communicate the, the different uh, nodes involved in the, in, in the decentralized sequencers and so on. And uh, you may also have to deal as on Ethereum with uh, uh, font running and, and MEV attacks. So uh, it's not a, a, an easy problem to solve. It's the same, actually, I think, as uh, on Ethereum. So you have to be careful with it. Um, so that's probably uh, yeah, the best uh, I can cover. So I can say that some mechanism here with a decentralized sequencer that have been proposed by, uh, for instance, Optimism uh, in the upcoming Bedrock or, or the next uh, iteration of it. Uh, they are mentioning that they would transition to decentralized sequencing by uh, rotating the sequencer. Um, I think rotating the sequencer is not at all decentralizing the sequencer. It's uh, rotating the centralization, which is a, a very different concept. So um, a good mechanism to provide some, uh, let's say, some low trust, low cost uh, decentralization on layer two is, is still to be, uh, to, to, to be uh, designed and, and properly uh, analyzed. I'm going to check the chat. Right, so um, I'll, I'll go to the chat after. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back. So that's the, the end of the, uh, let's say, the problems that I 
have identified. Again, that's not an exhaustive list of uh, all of the problems you, you can get, but uh, uh, that, that's some of them. And I'm going to look at the chat if there's no question. Uh, I'm scrolling back because I don't know which ones have been um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an awful answered lot of by questions. Peter. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it attempted to be answered by Peter, but you know, you should put in your own thoughts. And I know I've got a question yeah. or two myself, but well, let's just why don't we fire through a few of them in the chat? Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm still scrolling up. So uh, this one I remember I answered. Um, it's good to have a popular topic, isn't it, Frank? Yeah, yeah, it's good to have questions. Yeah. So let's see. Um, so the sequencer, I was stopped, I stopped there. So is the future uh, of roll-up dependent? Is the future of roll-ups dependent on the robust infrastructure of bridges or uh, is it tilted toward the toward your bridge less design? So there's some answers by Peter. Um, bridges L1 rollups are straightforward. Bridging roll-up to another L1. Another L2, right? Yes. So I don't know. I can't answer this question. I think it's moving very fast. I I, I wouldn't claim that I'm aware of all the solutions. So um, uh, I think it, it would be nice, for instance, let's say for um, 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 roll-up designers, right? Uh, your customers are going to ask you, "Oh, can I bridge uh, my assets, my uh, my token, ether, blah blah blah, uh, to to the roll-up?" So at the moment, if I'm correct, uh, most of the Bridges are on a, an ad hoc basis for each uh, token. So you design a, a twin uh, twin contracts uh, for Ether, twin contracts uh, to bridge Ether from uh, layer two, twin, uh, twin contracts to bridge uh, uh, near to layer two and layer one and so on. So it's an ad hoc process. And, and uh, even if it's an ERC-20 contract, um, there's no real good generic solution to bridge ERC-20 assets. They usually customize the contracts. Uh, that's what Arbitrum and Optimism say that they are doing. So having a sort of a more streamlined solution uh, would probably help. And, and the communication as well, the N1 and L2 messaging and L2 L1 messaging via uh, the logs of the event, it's something that's, uh, that's probably not optimal. Uh, you have to extract from uh, lots of texts uh, and also encrypted messages. You can't communicate uh, in plain text, right? You can't say, oh, uh, I'm bridging 10, 10 ether from this account to another one because I could publish the same message and fake it. So you have to really uh, make sure that it's properly encrypted. So the bridging, I think, is, a, is an issue. And lots of attacks on bridges uh, happened last year. I think it was more than two billion US dollars stolen uh, with bridges within bridges. Yeah. So the verifier, so Peter has answered some question. Um, the verifier is a contract on L1. Prover works with sequencer to generate proof to submit to verifier on L1, okay. How about the challenger of optimism, what does it fit? So if I'm correct, um, optimism, even in the newest bedrock iteration, they don't have fraud proof enabled. Um, so um, uh, I don't know what the challenger is in this uh, in this setting. Yeah, I, if the challenger I, is, a, is a verifier, they, they, that's not enabled yet. Yeah, I, I think I I recall there were some contracts to a that sort of looked like they were going to allow you to challenge, but um, mm -hmm. then there was another point that someone had that maybe that wasn't that. Um, I think there's an interesting mechanism in Arbitrum. Uh, you can have, of course, you can, you can, uh, well, in Arbitrum, the mechanism is that you can have validators uh, proposing new states. And there's a mechanism such that if at some point you have one state with more than um, two children, uh, there will be a dispute and the dispute will be resolved. And the states that have proposed the different states, they have to stake some assets to, 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 to stake to it. So the dispute will be resolved and the stakes may be slashed and so on. So this is a, a, a mechanism that's uh, 
somehow incorporating some uh, third party verification or validation. So it's in between um, voting like on Ethereum and uh, 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 and it triggers the fraud proof. So the fraud proof is triggered when after a certain amount of time, you've got two, um, uh, two children uh, branching out of a given state, they will be the uh, dispute resolution. In case the malicious, so where is it? this one, the challenger? Uh, why optimism verification takes seven days? What's the seven day? Oh yeah, so the seven day um, time window, it's an empirical number. Uh, so some people have decided that seven days should be enough for you to contest, but it could be one hour or two hours. Uh, I, I Honestly, I don't know uh, uh, if there is anything rational that can justify uh, the seven yeah. days. So, so I think the idea is that um, you don't want to have something bad happen just as there's a lot of network congestion. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like you can imagine someone does something that caused the whole network to be completely yeah, blocked. Yeah. And then someone says, hey, let's do something malicious now because mm -hmm. no one would be able to put a fraud proof in. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, but the that, seven days, I mean, it, yeah, it's, so, yeah. uh, it could be two days or three days. I don't know, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Why seven <laughs> days, not one? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can't, yeah, I, I, it would seem incredible that the whole of the Ethereum network could be completely jam packed for a whole day. Oh, yeah. But I don't know, maybe, I mean, a week fe feels safer for a, mm -hmm. a proof. So here's a question for you for asking one live. So, so we in, um, so in Polygon Edge, um, you've got like a decentralized, um, sequence. So you've essentially got an IBFT2 chain, blockchain. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, instant finality. And um, and so all the blocks are producing state. Um, and um, you've got these, um, you know, an ordered list of transactions. So that's your decentralized sequencer. And then mm -hmm. you've got zero, which is taking the trace of the tra transactions and producing a proof. And po you post that proof onto L1, and so we've we've you know we've been you know like trying to think what happens if there's a bug in the prover, you know, in the proof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of the verification uh, issue that I was mentioning. You can have a you can have, you're right. You can have a bug. Let's say you can have a bug in the EVM engine that you're going to use to replay the transaction. In the verifier, let's say the ZK, uh, the ZK prover, for instance, you can have a bug in the prover, you can have a bug in the circuit, you can have a bug in the prover and so on. So yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the way we came down to for recovering from that is you'd have a hard fork of essentially the proving engine you know, it's like, you know, how you can have a hard fork of a blockchain having a hard fork of an of a proving engine. And um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm just trying to think of, would you actually detect, you know, like, because uh, from what I can work out, you, you're going to create a valid proof. So it's still going to verify on the contracts on L1. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you would have incorrect state, but no one notices or cares i don't know i'm i've been grappling with that one for a, a few months to try and think about you know what does it really mean and does it really matter if you've essentially got two versions of the evm running producing the, yeah different... yeah so so the thing is basically nobody can tell right we, we can't formally prove that let's say um a zk proof which uh, in a zk proof you, you have embedded the semantics of the one semantics of the EVM in your proof relating to different states, to sequence of states, and so on. Uh, you have, uh, let's say, on the other side, get that's an implementation of the semantics. There are two implementations somehow. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, um, how do we decide which one is more trusted or trusted, right? Which one is the reference one? And I think it's something that you can't really resolve because uh, you need a formal, well, you would have a formal specification of the semantics, but what you need to know is probably uh, your, your computation is going to be checked against this semantics that's 
implemented in Geth or whatever. So you, you should know the target uh, or the reference of the, uh, the semantics. Otherwise, it's very hard to know. Um, I mean, you can honestly compute the correct next state, but the sort of the, the verifier will have the wrong code and, and you'll be slashed. So this is not right. And, and what you can observe is there's a difference into the, the next states that have been computed. What do you do in that specific case? Do you slash straightforwardly or you say, all right, um, maybe we should check uh, a, a bit more who's right, who's wrong? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's so no for, reference semantics. So for instance, I think the, the problem to me is really uh, between, let's say, Geth or Besu and so on, you can test them, right? You test them against a, a huge number of test, test suites. So you've got some confidence that they produce the same thing on a lot of different uh, uh, EVM uh, bytecode. But for ZK EVMs, you're encoding the semantics of the, Z, of, of the EVM into constraints constraints and then circuits and then polynomials and blah, blah, blah. You don't have an executable semantic, so you can't really test it against an existing one. So that's a, a big issue. And, and the, the encoding into all of these uh, different layers, right, polynomials, uh, constraints, and so on, is not trivial. So there's a lot of room for uh, errors in that, uh, in that encoding. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a discussion um, in the chat about um, whether patching the prover is not a big, as big issue because it's non-chain. Um, so the code's not on chain. The code's not on chain, but I think the proof would have been published on chain. So on chain. So if you, um, I mean, the thing I was thinking is if in your constraints engine inside of your circuits um you had missed a constraint and then mm -hmm. had a bug in the circuit that wasn't being detected because you were missing a constraint mm -hmm. then i think you're going to end up with an invalid yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the wrong state but then yeah and then you'd have to do a hard fork to get to back to the correct state mm -hmm. yeah i agree with that yeah uh yeah but uh, so i see the chat invalid proofs will be rejected yes uh, i understand that but the rejection will be the prover has rejected the proof but we don't know whether the prover itself um uh, is not buggy so the prover should be um i would say yeah that should be okay to design the prover that's not buggy the proof itself the mechanism to generate the proof is very tricky. So you can have a, um, a mistake in the, in the semantics that you've encoded in the, in the ZK proof, and then um, uh, you can't really trust uh, that, that the, uh, the fact that the prover accepted the proof is, uh, is a valid well, argument. Well, and that's the thing. If, you, yeah, if you're missing a constraint, then you could accept the proof, but it still could be wrong. Yes. Um, so, so, so there's a sort of a, we accept that there's some trust and some trusted components and i think to me that that's what we should be aware of uh, what is assumed to be trusted and we can't do anything about it so it's not about having the correct semantics but the, it's having the reference of what is the correct semantics what 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 is going to be used to um, uh, to resolve disputes that you need to know yeah yeah, yeah. and ron has said something about um elio alio is working on a certified yes. compilation yes yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, exactly yeah, yeah yeah so that's not, well uh, again these problems these are problems that i have identified on my own these are problems i think are important and uh, there are some people working on them already yeah, yeah that's good yeah. to know sounds yeah. good could you share your slides again and can we do those last slides oh yes sorry yeah, yeah. That. oh no that's okay let's talk about what's coming up next if I can retrieve it, let's see. Um, yeah, or, I no, 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 that's it, that's it. Sorry. Click on the wrong one.
Oh, yeah. That's... I can't find it. Oh, yeah, I've, I think I've just about to have it here. And, um, and I'm just going to have it open, hopefully, in 54321. Yeah. All right. Just got to wait for it to turn up. But anyway, it looks. I quite... shouldn't share mine then. Yeah. No, actually, that's not happening for me. So let's. You know how life is sometimes when you just want to look at something and. I can uh, I can share it. That's okay. I've got the. Um, yep. Yeah. So that. Last slide. This one. Right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's enough. Yep. All right. Yes. So the. So the merch store is is open. So um, get your cool merch, which is good, including this T-shirt here. Um, next slide. All right. So we've got a few talks coming up. So we're actually got a winter break for um, a few weeks now. And then after we come back, and for those in the Northern Hemisphere, a summer break. Um, and um, so we've got Adig Benga, um, who's on the call right now, um, is going to give a talk on Paymaster Smart Contracts, which is going to be awesome. And then the week after that, we've got Jaden Windle is going to talk about um, ERC6551. And then Philip Zentner's, Zent, Zentner is going to talk about um, the case for bridge aggregation. And um, then after that, we're going to um, hear about um, Forge development. So using uh, Forge for Solidity development, and that's going to be August 30. Um, and then the last slide is this one. So if you're here today, there's a YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, you want to join live, there's the Slack um, invite um, for the Slack workspace, and there's the meetup group. Sometimes we have example code, you'll find it on there. If you're interested in formal methods, there's a reading group that gets together reasonably regularly, join the Slack workspace, and you'll hear all about that. So um, thank you, Frank, for that. And um, yeah, so look, thank you for a great talk. And um, yeah, Hopefully people have learned stuff and um, yeah, I guess we'll see you all in a f about two or three weeks time. And Adag Benga is gonna um, be telling us all about Paymaster stuff at that point, which would be cool. So um, see you all then. See you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks Frank, that was awesome.